This is a 15-year-old male complaining of deep muscle pain in the right hip for 11 days since a soccer injury. So let's go back to our earlier discussion. You know, you've got to think about what disorders you're hunting. Because this is going to narrow your search pattern. Otherwise, you could be here all day. I mean, look at how much information's on here. You've got, you know, uteruses and ovaries and prostates and, and, and pelvic sidewalls and nodes and ureters and bladders. And then you've got the entire skeleton to contend with. You've got sports hernias. You've got the midline. You've got the hips themselves, the trochanteric bursa. And when you're dealing with a hip, one of the reasons why the hip is such a challenging joint, one of many reasons, but one reason is there's a lot of referred pain. I mean, it is not uncommon in an elderly person with an insufficiency fracture of the sacrum to complain of pain in the hip. I mean, that's a pretty long, that's a pretty long distance. So you've got to cover a very broad swath of anatomy when somebody has hip pain or groin pain before you say the examination is normal. Whereas somebody comes in with lateral elbow pain, almost always, their problem is in the lateral compartment of the elbow. You don't have very far to look. And the hip is also a big place. It's much bigger than the elbow. So let's think about what types of things would concern us in a 15-year-old young man who's playing soccer. Sounds like a traumatic injury, right? So we think about things like bone injuries and labral injuries and, and dislocations on the field and strains of muscles, tears of muscles, avulsions of muscles. You might think of apophys apophysitis. This didn't come on gradually like our osteoid osteoma. It came on suddenly after a sporting event. So we'd be thinking about the various types of sports injuries that would occur in this region. And that's how we would construct our search pattern. So let's do that. And immediately, we are dialed into on our axial water-emphasized sequence. And we'll magnify it up just a little bit. We're immediately dialed into a large area of high signal intensity. You're probably also dialed into the loss of the cortical outline of the acetabulum. So right away, if you go to the correct sequence and you, you're, you've already pre-thought out the types of things that concern you, you can be so efficient and so expedient and so confident in relaying your diagnosis that you can just get right up there in the reading room, right on the telephone, and look at the image and, and say to the clinician what you think is wrong, how it happened, what's involved, and then put in all the important details. So let's do a little scrolling here. And we're scrolling down towards the ischium. And then we're scrolling up. Here's our acetabulum. And there is our acetabular roof, right? Because there's the femoral head. So what is this area that lies anteriorly right above the acetabular roof? Why, it's the anterior inferior iliac spine. We haven't even looked at anything else yet. And we've already figured out that the anterior inferior iliac spine is detached. And what comes off the anterior inferior iliac spine? The rectus femoris, it has a bipennate origin. One origin from the acetabular roof and another origin from the anterior inferior iliac spine. We're going to see in other discussions that the rectus femoris is a complex structure. It crosses two joints. It has a bipennate origin. It has a direct head, an indirect head, a posterior fascial layer all things we're going to talk about in some detail later on. But right now, our focus is the hip. So let's continue on with this rather straightforward case. 
that illustrates an approach to, to analyzing the hip. The study was performed unilaterally. It was done at, at high field. And here is the rest of our, our high field fat suppressed image, this time sagittally. And it shows beautifully. I mean, that is just gorgeous. It shows the bipennate origin of the rectus. And the one that's avulsed, separated by X number of millimeters, because they're going to want to know what the gap is, X number of millimeters from the anterior inferior iliac spine. They're also going to want to know if there's a piece of bone that came off. And we already established that when we traced the cortex and then lost the cortex anteriorly. So there is a true rectus avulsion. In other words, there's a piece of bone that's come off with it, and we can make this measurement right here. And there is the bipennate appearance of the origin, this one going to the acetabular roof. Now we'll turn our attention to the axial T2, which really adds very little to the diagnosis other than once again showing you the piece of bone and the tendon and the separation from the anterior inferior iliac spine. It also allows us to see the jagged appearance of the fractured uh, spine and the loss of the cortex. And then finally, a bilateral exam demonstrating a normal rectus takeoff from the AIIS on the left and an abnormal takeoff with separation from the AIIS, which can also be measured. And then finally, the coronal T1 going back to the same location. One sees the round, smooth, corticated left AIIS, and on the right, clearly jagged, irregular, and deformed due to the avulsion fracture and the separation of the rectus from the bone. Are there any questions about this case of rectus femoris, avulsion injury of the anterior inferior iliac spine in a young adducting athlete, by the way, also a hip flexing athlete?